computer. Oh, here we go. Hello, everybody. It's another Thursday night, and we are back as the formidable riotous trio. Oh. We have missed Giselle for a while. Um, she's been away doing all manner of wonderful things for family and country, but we are pleased to have her back right where she belongs. Um, yes. Oh, yes. I'm glad to be back. Welcome back, G. Oh. Um, it's yeah, it's not been the same without you. So we're looking forward to carrying on our conversations. Um, tonight we are going to talk about leaving a legacy. Um, G thought it'd be a really, really, really good conversation for us to look at and perhaps introspect and examine what sorts of legacy that we are leaving. Um. And I think I'll let G introduce what Bible verses we're standing on for this one, because she feels very passionate about legacies and, and how we're living and, and sort of the characters that we're exhibiting and what people are saying about us. So over to you, G. Oh, thank you so much, my dear. What's really making me think about this is I have a dear friend who passed away very suddenly just over a week ago. And when I've been out round telling neighbours in the village that Eileen has passed away, one neighbour said about Eileen, oh, she is such a beautiful lady. That is so sad. And, you know, I have never seen her bother with people and I've never heard her say a bad word about anybody. Wow. Like, what a legacy is that? Yeah. And that makes you think beautiful. also, too, that when... Boaz came up to Ruth when she was gleaming in the fields and he said, mm -hmm. I have heard it said of you mm -hmm. that she looks after Naomi, yada, yada, mm -hmm. yada, yada, yada. And then when you jump to Genesis or go back to Genesis, when young Joseph is in jail for a crime he didn't commit, uh, mm -hmm. but the cupbearer reminded Joseph to the Pharaoh to have a dream interpreted. Pharaoh mm -hmm. said to Joseph, I have heard it said of you, that he interprets dreams, but I have heard it said of you. Now, I think those are three wonderful things. You, know, I have heard it said of you. Mm -hmm. What are we leaving behind that people have heard said about us? Are we nice people? Are we kind to other people? Are we gossips? Are we troublemakers? Are we mm -hmm. helpful? Are we whatever? And that's where I'm coming from. That's such a it's such a powerful thing, isn't it? Because I suppose this is we go about living our lives. Sometimes we don't really think about the effect mm -hmm. that we have on people, even just fleetingly. I mean, how many times, you know, sometimes people we we say in in the secular world we say you know be kind or you know smile at somebody and and but like the effect that that can have on another human being. Mm -hmm. Um, like how many times have you given somebody just smile at a random stranger and mm -hmm. they just turn around and said, That's really made my day. Um yeah. and and that can also be like the opposite effect. You know, sometimes we lose our temper. Um and when you sit back and you think on what happened, you realize actually that person must have felt really bad. Like I had like my reaction to that would have just made that person feel bad, but it wasn't called for. Um, and I think that's just something that we ought to we ought to bear in mind, especially as we become, as we grow in our faith. And and there's also, like, I'm very aware that for me personally, anyway, every day that I live is a day closer to the grave. Um, I feel like every day that I live, and I know some people will say that is such a pessimistic <laughs> <laughs> way of viewing life. <laughs> no, it's not. But it's true it's reality. reality. But for me, that gives me perspective. For me, that just gives me perspective that every day I am I am closer to the grave today than I was yesterday. Mm -hmm. And so I'm closer to judgment today than I was yesterday. And, and if that day should come sooner than I would like it to come, um, I would like to make, if today were my last day, I would like to mm -hmm. hope that I hadn't caused mayhem on my house. <laughs> Oh dear. Oh dear. So, so 
So you're thinking that I might get judged and all the mayhem I've caused. <laughs> well, do you know what I mean? Like, like imagine a situation where, like, you know, heaven forbid, you know, one goes to, to sleep and doesn't wake up and, and you meet God and God is like, I really just had to call you home because the trouble you had planned in the next five years. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Mm, uh-huh. that, that is very true. Yeah. Mm, but I uh, think you know, as as Christians, especially, uh, we're called to be Christ-like. Yes. And we so, are. when we are thinking about being Christ-like with regards to our relationship with other people, what do you think? You know, what do you think that represents in your everyday life? Wow. <laughs> First of all. In my everyday life, I think it just means, in a nutshell, treating people how you would like to be treated, you know. Um, so it's literally, yeah, for me, it's it's that, you know, just trying to be the best person you can be to someone. You know, being polite to your colleagues at work. You know, if you work in a team, try and be that team member. You know, we all have that mo- those moments where we don't really want to do anything. But mm. I think sometimes also just going out of your way, the number of times I haven't felt like doing a good thing, right? But I think the thing with you being a Christian is that, and I think not necessarily, like if you have a conscience as a person, there's always that thing at the back of your mind. Because I feel like every human being is outfitted with a conscience, whether or not you believe in God, we all know the difference between right and wrong. Mm -hmm. And so when you're about to do something that you shouldn't do, there's always that thing in you that tells you "Mm, what you're doing is not, it's not great. Mm -hmm. But as a Christian, you know, that's the voice of the Holy Spirit. So Mm -hmm. I think it's just being in touch, right? With the Holy Spirit. Um, Yeah. Just being in touch with the word of God and trying to apply it in your life. Mm -hmm. And I think also for me, realistically knowing that my efforts are not enough because trust me, on an average day, there are many unchristlike things that I could be doing. <laughs> there are many. So I need the help. The Holy Spirit. And so, G, G, how would you say then, on those days or in those moments where we are tempted to give into our flesh um, and, and, and seek vengeance or, you know, want to get our own back or, or just do what we would want to do as opposed to what the Holy Spirit would have us do? Ooh. How would you, what would you say is, like a good way to overcome those moments oh my goodness me that is such a great question and you know as especially as women with our emotions all over the place at different times you know being pregnant uh, Mm. through menstrual cycles after Mm. and say dealing with difficult kids and everything i think it's tough being a woman Mm -hmm. um here here it you know it 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 really is. You know, I've often said that if men gave birth, there would be an awful lot of one children families around the world, because you know, <laughs> and, and there, be China. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and and there is the funny Mimi going about social media and everything that uh, uh, God decided to let women give birth because He saw how men reacted to colds. You know, so yeah, it's 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 absolutely true. I believe but, that. Yeah, big time. But our emotions, we, it's easy for me to sit here and say we should let God be God and put mm. our emotions in his hands. But we are human beings after all. And lots of times the flesh does take over. Mm-hmm. And I think that if we do let our fleshly selves take over and we let our emotions rage, I mean, Gwenda, you know, a rage and we'll pull the hair out by the roots or we go and you know challenge somebody or something for something that was said or did to us or whatever mm. when we learn that that was the wrong way to handle it we should learn from that mistake and Hallelujah. build in that so that the next time we can stand back and bite the inside of our lip the inside of our cheek and mm-hmm. wait before we jump in you know, wasn't it was saying that uh uh, uh Fools tread where angels fear. I think fear, fear to go. Isn't that isn't that right? Um, mm, something like that. But like you, know, as as you were asking uh, Naomi about being Christ, like you, and what that is is about. As Christians, we are empowered by the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. and we should be possessing those big inner qualities that Christ possessed. 
Mm. And one of his great qualities was his prayer life, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm. He did nothing without prayer. So I think then in that aspect, really, to answer your question would be be Christ-like. And no matter mm. what situation comes to us, before we act in the flesh, let's mm. pray about it. Let's mm. take a moment. Let's sit down, have a cup of coffee with God mm. and uh, pray about it. Talk to God about it and see where he guides you because the Holy mm. Spirit does good. If we keep going off and running after it, running off and undoing, doing what we want ourselves, we can't say we let the Holy Spirit guide us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. That, that could be what. That itself so can true. be hard. Mm -hmm. It can be. The flesh is strong. Big time. But I, I also think, I also think that a confession is one of the ways that God has established to help us rule over the flesh. Because if we practice the act of confessing our sins to one another mm -hmm. and apologizing to one another, yeah. there's nothing worse than. Like, you know you were wrong and you know you've got to fess up mm -hmm. and you know you've got to apologize to the person. That will put yes. you in check the next time you're about to do that thing. I, I yeah. think, like, confession is just a wonderful mechanism that God mm -hmm. has put in place to also just give us that little bit of a sting to our pride and our ego every now and again. So I think if we are open and honest with those in our lives enough, yeah. Um, and get comfortable with owning up and fessing up. Mm -hmm. You know, fessing up is a short form of confessing. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 even with with non Christians, it's 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 a wonderful thing to be able. It's it's humbling. Yep. Like yeah. If you get into the into the the rhythm and um, how can I put it into into the habit of confessing to those that you you yep. offend and mm -hmm. seeking forgiveness. It's wonderfully like it takes the focus away from your pride, whatever, however big that may be in your ego. Mm -hmm. Um, and it takes you out of yourself. But it also, I think anyway, is a deterrent. Um, because you see it even in children, like oh, sometimes the they worst. know they've done wrong, mm -hmm. but they don't want to say sorry. Yep. Like the word oh, no, sorry. they say a very lame sorry. It's like yeah, say it's sorry, really to hard. sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah. But you know something um, else? Now, I don't mean we should go about apologizing for everything to everybody. Mm. But when, if there's, say, an argument between two girlfriends or a sibling mm -hmm. or what, 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 whatever, what's, what, whatever sort of an argument, mm -hmm. be the bigger person. If it's, if it's causing a divide, be the bigger person and go and say, look, if I've done anything to upset you or annoy you, I am sincerely sorry. Then mm -hmm. what you find is generally the other person goes, oh, no, no, it wasn't you who did anything. It was me. And I'm sorry. I should be apologizing to you. Mm -hmm. Because lots of times people find it hard to apologize or don't know how to apologize. Whereas mm -hmm. if you approach it, if you're mature, more mature spiritually, and you approach mm -hmm. it, first of all, it opens it up for them. But it's like, I don't mean you should go and about apologize for apologize, everybody no. for, for, for no. everything. But let's mm. you know, let's be mm. bigger people about it. That's mm. yeah. I might have might have been my attitude or something like that. So let's go and get it sorted yeah. out. It's hard to be <laughs> sometimes it's nice to be petty. <laughs> sometimes it's like I'm just gonna be petty. But oh. I want to ask something. You said something very goodly about people not wanting to apologize. And I have to say, for me personally. That's kind of like a pet peeve because some people are so proud, right? You oh. know you are wrong. All the evidence is stacked against you, but you're like, no. And I'm just like, so why should I say anything to you? Mm -hmm. But what? Forget about me, guys. But what I was going to ask is if people don't know how to apologize or maybe they feel like, because I feel like for some people, it's if I apologize, they're going to look at me a certain way or I'm going to lose my coolness or whatever it is. What are the, what the, um, characteristics if you like of a good apology because I feel like a lot of people really don't know how to apologize and I'll tell you personally a bad apology can be even more annoying <laughs> oh, <laughs> you better say nothing <laughs> so, yeah. do you know what that's that's interesting but I think it's twofold because I think I think sometimes the person that's been apologized to or the mm -hmm. person that's been offended 
sometimes is the one with the problem because sometimes they have an idea as to what they think an apology should be whereas that's not really like you don't get to set the standard of what an apology should be as long as the person who's offering the apology is sincere Uh and you can tell that's the the apology that's true but i feel like sometimes right people and this is something that's happened to me where someone says it's a really lazy apology it's almost like how can i Okay, for me personally, I feel like your motive really matters because Mm -hmm. there are times when I feel like you, people apologize for different reasons. Maybe you just want to stay in this person's good graces Mm -hmm. or, and I've I've had that sometimes where you're just like, you really want this thing off your conscience. So it's not Mm -hmm. like you're really sorry. (laughs) You just, and you you do something to hurt somebody and then you just send one line like, sorry. And the person is Mm -hmm. like, what? Sorry for what exactly? So Mm. I feel like if you're going to apologize to somebody, you Mm. have to also acknowledge that, okay, I've hurt your feelings. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sorry for what I did. And more importantly for me in particular, but I feel like for other people, because I've read it in other places, an apology doesn't kind of buy you your past till next time. I know we all hurt each other, but I feel like if you if you really mean something, you're going to try and do two things. If there's a way of making it up to somebody, you will. Mm. Or at least you would try not to hurt somebody because there are people who apologize every two months. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Especially if this is one of the reasons why sometimes being a forgiving person <laughs> can be like that, can sort of put you in places where you don't want to be. Because there are some people who know, like their friends' characters, that, oh, this person is laid back. I'll do this thing and then apologize later. They'll be fine. So yeah, I think that's where I was sort of coming from. The sincerity of but your that's heart. That's taking that's matters. taking the make. And I think you know what? Do you and people do it. Yeah, they do. They do. Yeah. They do. They do big time. They really do. Mm. But I also think you you know when someone's being sincere. Like and exactly. you know. Like exactly. I think as you the one receiving the apology, you yes. know. And you know how many times you've been down that road. Um, you know, I think one of the ladies in, is ladies in the group has said something about, you know, a family member that just keeps reoffending how to deal with that. But I think, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, you've got to have those conversations and, and being forgiving does not mean that you don't have those conversations. Yeah, You've got to have those conversations because if we're to be like Christ, Christ doesn't shy away from telling us when we're being, you know, sinful yeah. or mm-hmm. angry. He tells us. And, and also the wonderful thing about God is that he sets boundaries. God yes. sets boundaries between, yes. you know, within which we are to operate and behave. Yes. And so I think it's not unrealistic for you to set boundaries with certain family members. Um, mm-hmm. Now, if you're a laid back, forgiving person, that might not be as well received as someone who they think is just uppity and rude and snobbish anyway, because they think you might be a bit more of a walkover. But I think, you know, God sets boundaries and the framework within which we should behave ourselves and live our lives. Mm-hmm it's not it's not unlike god um you know if we were to speak to to those people that are are constantly Mm reoffending and offending us to say look you know you keep doing this and i'm happy to keep forgiving you because the bible says you know i should forgive you 77 times seven times in a day as one of my children reminded me today um it's like you know i'm called to forgive you that many times no matter how many times you annoy me however i expect growth I don't expect you to go from zero to a hundred in a day or a year, Mm -hmm. but I expect to see a better you, which is what I said to the said child. I said, that's fine. I'll keep forgiving you, but I expect to see a better you next week than I did this week. And I said, I love said said child anyway. Said child is set up for a career in law. I can assure you. (laughs) Said child. But listen, but, see, 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 see the question that the lady in the group asked about about the mm. toxic person. Do you keep a distance? You uh, somebody doing hurting yes. you over and over mm. and over. Do you keep a distance? I say yes, mm. because sometimes God re- needs to remove people from our lives because where mm. God is taking us, those people can't go. Mm. And now, I speak from experience. That many, 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 many years ago, my family gave me the ultimatum that it was either God or them. And I wow. said, okay, that's a no-brainer. It's God. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm. And I walked mm-hmm. away from my family. Mm-hmm. And about five years down the road, 
one of my sisters contacted me again and we have a completely new relationship so we have the other mm. brother won't have anything to do with me but in mm. god's timing if he wants them to have something in more contact mm. with me it'll mm. happen but mm. Now, I'm not saying that we should just walk away from every Tom, Dick and Harry and throw relationships away. But what mm. I am saying is that we should know the difference when God is pulling us away from certain people. Because mm. we have a tendency that if an argument ensues or uh, uh, the hurts keep coming, we have a tendency to keep going back for more. Mm. True. Especially, I think, sometimes as Christians, we have to be careful how we use this word forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Because like you said, Sidoni, there are people who use that 77 times 7. And say to you, oh, but please, you have to forgive me. And they don't change, right? They, it's almost like you're some kind of bottomless pit of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like, yes, sometimes it's important to keep your distance mm -hmm. for the sake of your mental health. Mm -hmm. Because it can get very draining mm -hmm. to deal with people mm -hmm. who just... If somebody keeps reoffending you for the same thing and you've talked about mm. it, it means they're not even hearing you. Mm. So mm. there has to come a point where you have to. It's not really selfish. It's mm. just you prioritizing your welfare mm. because you have situations think, where people, yeah, yeah, yeah. where people say, tell you, once... yeah. Mm -hmm, go on. Now I was just saying you have situations where people begin then to have physical and psychological symptoms mm. from being close to somebody. You get mm. off the phone with a family member or a friend. You're having palpitations. If you get mm. to that stage, you need to at least take a break and reevaluate. Mm hundred -hmm. mm -hmm. percent. But I think one 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 of the things that struck me, G, as you were talking, is that you left the door open for reconciliation, and I think that's the difference between Christians yeah. and non Christians. Mm -hmm. Non Christians will just shut that door, and that's it. You're out of my life. You know, you're gone. Mm. But I think as Christians. Um, even though we set those healthy boundaries, mm -hmm. we still do have to leave the door open for reconciliation. Um, yeah. So I was speaking to a young person and <clears throat> they've been, you know, she's been having problems with, with one particular friend and this friend keeps being mean to her and apologising and being, and it's it's like a cycle, you know, like mm -hmm. a vicious cycle. Like she'll apologise, then she's mean, then she apologises. And I think that's not healthy. Um, yes. And I said, you know, I think you should tell that person that they're not your friend anymore. However, tell the girl that this is, should you wish to be my friend in the future, this is how I expect you to behave. Yes. Once you start behaving that, um, and I think that's important in terms of reconciliation, mm -hmm. because we all know that, you know, we'll all, we'll all err and we'll all hurt people and we'll all fail. But I think also for the other person, it's because I think sometimes, especially with like, you know, Gen Z or, or I don't know what generation we're on at the minute, and it's just getting weirder and weirder. You're on Gen um, Z. There's, a, there's a cancel culture that oh, is yeah. very rife at the moment. And it's this whole thing of they cancel you and you're gone. Like, like you, they literally wipe you off. Yeah. <laughs> like they can write someone off. Mm -hmm. And it's such a negative thing and I only say that because I you know when I speak to, to teenagers and I see the psychological effect that that has yes. even within like teenagers within the church but because wow. it's secular and that's what they see and I'm like but God never writes us off. and yes. so us as human beings we do not get to write people off you know it, God is the mm -hmm. prodigal father he's there with his arms open but he leaves that door open for reconciliation. But we are mm -hmm. to make the first step. We are the ones that are to come running back to him. And yeah. so I think, you, you know, what, what was really good there, like you, you illustrated, was that even though you, you told your sisters very firmly where you stood, mm -hmm. you still, hi, Queenie, you still left the door open for yeah. her, for when she changed and she changed her behavior towards you and towards your faith. Yes. There was still that door open where you could have a relationship of sorts. Um, and I think that's that's really, really important because, mm -hmm. you know, we're talking about legacy mm -hmm. and, and sort of what you live behind. And I think a few months ago I was thinking about this and I was like, it's not it's not money, is it? It's not like mm -hmm. yep. it's not houses. Yeah. It's not like the inheritance that we can leave. 
yep. is basically our relationships with people. Mm. That's that's how people will remember yeah. us. Yeah. Now, if, 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 we're, if we're rich enough to be like, for example, James Carnegie, who built a Scotsman who went to America and built Carnegie Hall, like it's yeah. still there and people still remember, oh, this Scot immigrant, he was so wealthy, he built this and he built the other things. But we're all not wealthy enough to leave large buildings like that behind for our legacy. Mm. But, but, we I mean, can, but we can leave good things behind. Now, you... You, you two know that my dream is that for my legacy to be left behind is the ministry. Mm-hmm. And I, 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 I would love it to carry on after I go. And that would be a good legacy. But also I would like people to be, to say something nice about me, like my neighbour said about Eileen, go away, Queenie, go mm-hmm. on. Or, <laughs> you know, to, 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 to phrase the words of the Pharaoh to Joseph or Boaz mm-hmm. to Ruth. I have heard it said of her. You know, she's never oh. said a bad word of it, and I've got. She a... was DJ Crazy G. Yeah, she, I think. Was, yeah she, she, she was the craziest woman we ever knew. I tell you, mm-hmm. uh-huh. a real rebel mm-hmm. riser. But you know, and they will say that because at my funeral, well, it's not going to be a funeral. It's going to be a celebration of life service. Mm-hmm. I have a video made. I'm conducting the service. Oh wow, G! That's yes, that's I saw so you. Yes, because I don't trust anybody else to do it right. I'm doing it. Okay, she has gone. <laughs> you see, see, like you're already creating what's going to be said of you because for exactly. somebody to have thought that far, you're organized. You kind of know what you want. And, you know, you know how you want <laughs> it done. And you would be like frowning at the preacher from her coffin going, you got that wrong. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It'll be sort of you down at the back, down there crying, wipe your tears, pull up your big girl knickers and carry on with life. No crying here. Mm -hmm. and of course there'll be a call of salvation because i know there'll be a lot of non-believers there right there's enough believers here get yourselves saved (laughs) Mm, (laughs) that's just so wonderful isn't it that's that's like that's also living your life intentionally and i think Mm -hmm. that's part of of leaving a legacy just being intentional intentional about how you live your life and it might just mean that you know and for some people it's hard like it's hard. Some people really do struggle. Like I speak to some women and they really do struggle. Like one day to, to the next is a real struggle. It and is. so for, for those women, it's just something like just smiling at somebody. That's just the first step. Exactly. You know, we're, we're not if if you're in that place where you're really struggling, or it's not you, or you're neurodiverse, um, and you have other things that you really make it hard there are other ways in which you can leave a legacy um and I you know I I, there's there's a there's some people in my church I know and and it's just beautiful because you can tell like they struggle um but they'll make you a cup of tea after the service they won't look you in the eye but they'll come give you a cup of tea Mm -hmm. um and for me that's that's touching Yes. Yeah. Um, it's just that they've thought outside of themselves. Um, and there's, there's some people for whom even going to the supermarket is it's a big it's a big, it's oh, a big yeah. thing. Leaving yeah. the house and going shopping is a big thing. But it's just that thing of okay, well you're out there and you're doing it and you see a homeless person and you've got spare change um, that you can spare and you toss it in there. You don't even have to look at them in the eye. Just toss it there. And you say a quick prayer whilst you know with them, or whilst you're walking away, pray for them. Mm-hmm. That's something because to you that might just be twenty p or ten pence, but to that person, by the end of the day, that might be the difference between a sandwich and a cup of tea that it's day or lot. not. Yeah. It 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 really is. Oh, even just being noticed, because you know what I I feel not that I feel. I think sometimes a lot of homeless people don't get noticed. Like you could be because. People are walking by doing whatever they're doing, right? You could be sitting there the whole day and nobody notices you. No one talks mm. to you. And I remember a friend telling me this. He had a conversation with a guy in Bristol, um, a homeless guy, and he ended up writing this amazing poem about it, about just being seen. Sometimes some homeless people care more about the conversation you have with them mm-hmm. than mm. the money you give them. Of course, if you can do both, great. Sometimes you're in a rush. Help them find somewhere to stay for the night. Or to mm-hmm. have a sandwich, but yeah, it's really important to just look at them as people. It is, mm-hmm. and as Sadoni said, you 
talking about a homeless person, pray for them. Now, sometimes we even ask them, can I pray for you and pray with you? They'll say yes. And they're really open to having a prayer said yes. over them. Mm -hmm. And that was, I know that was the key to my sister coming back and having a, a, a totally right. new relationship with me. Because one, yes, you're right, Sidoni, I kept the door open and it's important to keep a door open for relationships. But mm. also what I did was I prayed. Like, did I mm. pray for them every day? No. Did I pray for them once a week? No. Mm. But a couple mm. of times, three times a month, I would pray for them. I, I prayed mm. whenever God reminded me of them. He would just drop mm. one of their names in my mind and I would just lift the whole family up in prayer. So that's the key about it is, too, that when you know it's God taking people away from you, um, mm. pray for them. Mm. Because there is power it's in prayer. Prayer does change. Prayer does move mountains. Yeah, it can change things. It does change hearts. Really and we know the acronym for push, you know, uh, pray until something happens. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, and again, we've often talked about it here in the group. We've often mentioned, again, the old uh, cliche that goes about that as born-again believers, we might be the only Bible that non-believers are ever going mm -hmm. to read. Mm -hmm. Anybody's ever going to read. So we mm -hmm. need to be sure that we're acting out biblical principle in our everyday mm -hmm. lives. Mm -hmm. And you, know, when we get to heaven, we're going to meet an awful lot of people that we didn't know that we mm. not impress but impact it with our lives and yes. how we handle things and yeah. our how we handled it brought them to faith and we don't know about mm. it so that's yeah. so prepared true for that mm -hmm. yeah that's, that's true. so true isn't it yeah one of our ladies sharon is just you know asking me about um you know um autism and just neurodiversity and and how you would handle that with interacting with people because already some of the traits just make it that much more difficult socially um, and emotionally but I think one of the big things that you can do is use yourself to raise awareness because mm. certainly in neurotypical people myself included can be so ignorant and so blind mm -hmm. to how neurodiverse people view the world and yes. sometimes because the world is created for the neurotypical, <laughs> we don't often understand exactly. and, and appreciate the amount of effort that neurodiverse people go through just to fit in our world. So yes. I think if, if you're a neurodiverse person in any situation, I think the biggest thing that you can do is voice up. Mm -hmm. Because when you do that, you let the neurotypical people know, hang on a minute, you might have to do some adjustments yep. to, to let me fit in. Mm -hmm. And what that then does is it signals to other people that might be neurodiverse, that have been keeping quiet for donkey years, mm -hmm. um, to say, oh, hang on, there's more than me here. There's two of us. Or there's three of us. Okay, mm -hmm. my traits on the spectrum might not be as high as yours in social awareness, but I've got a bit of a spatial um, awareness yes. problem where... I don't quite know where I'm standing from time to time. And so, but then they, they, they're they not alone. Then they come and sit along alongside you. Mm -hmm. But then what that says to the neurotypical people is, is, hold on a minute, you guys get your, you know, heads out of your dairy ears and actually think outside of yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. And that's a brilliant point you've made, Sidoni. And funny mm -hmm. enough, I saw a friend earlier on Facebook post something about that that people with disabilities are taught how to interact in the world, but rarely are taught how to interact with them. True. Yes. It, true. It, it, it is true. true. It is very true. It is. Mm -hmm. So, And it's not mm -hmm. to say you should wear it as a badge, because I know no. within the new um, diverse community, there are some people that don't want to be identified as their, you know, as their autistic traits, and that's 100% fine. But I do think if you would like the neurotypical people to make adjustments mm -hmm. for you to flourish, I do think that the neurodiverse need to be able to, and it's not, you know, it's not a big announcement. It's, it's you know, approach one or two people you feel comfortable with um, in that setting and say, oh, you know, 
I might I'm struggling with this or I struggle with this or I struggle to understand mm-hmm. people um or I often get misunderstood because they don't quite explain things the way I want them to explain it and so it just goes mm-hmm. all over my head um but then what that says is like I said if, if there's another neurotypical person looking in they appreciate you speaking up mm-hmm. because all of a sudden it's like okay come on it's more than there's more than one of us it's a pack mentality yeah. And then the neurotypical people actually then start thinking, hang on, but you've been with us for X number of years and we've never really never thought how hard yeah. yeah, it's been for you. Um, so I think that's a great, great encouragement and a great legacy um, to leave, especially in your local church. Yes. Just imagine if you're a neurotypical and neurodiverse person in your local church and you're able to change one aspect of the service or one aspect of the worship life in your church Mm -hmm. so that neurotypical people within that church family can enjoy it a bit more Mm -hmm. that's a wonderful legacy to live in that church that is that is yeah definitely and big time i think churches are becoming more aware of this because it's interesting Mm. you should say that sidoni i had never even thought about this till somebody did a facebook live it's a lady who has a son who has like he's quite um far along the spectrum he's non-verbal very sensitive to light and things like that and mm-hmm. she had this forum with different um pastors priests i think just to look at how the church does worship for people who mm-hmm. are neurodiverse and it was very interesting because she what she had i think she invited a priest on and he was very honest he was like i'm sorry i don't think i can be an addition to your program because i don't really understand it myself mm-hmm. we're not actively doing anything and i think even for him to admit that was good because then hopefully he took that back to his parish and they thought, oh, what do we do now? But mm-hmm. yeah, it's something, I don't know. I have to look at my church and to see what we do. I know we do stuff for people who are hard of hearing and mm-hmm. uh, deaf. But it's something that I'm very glad the church is really waking up to. Mm-hmm. And it's wonderful. It's a wonderful legacy to have. And if you're a, if you're a neurotypical person with neurodiverse people in your life, um, or, or or you know people that have a disability whether that's ADHD or blindness or deafness or any anything that you think might impact them from the living a quote-unquote um, normal life I use the word normal there very loosely um, then I think that's also a way of, of, of leaving a legacy because you know if, if you were to, to die tomorrow um, mm-hmm. and it's said of you that this person really had a heart for the disabled um, you know, it, it could be said of you that this person really had a heart for inclusivity in the family of, of mm-hmm. Christ. And that's a wonderful legacy for that. Um, because I think yeah. that's what Jesus wants. Jesus wants all of us to be part of the same family, regardless of ability, um, race, gender. We're all one family. And so if you are that person who is fighting to leave that legacy, that includes everybody in the body of Christ and the church family. I think that's a wonderful legacy to have Wouldn't it? um Big time. It, it's just yeah and, and that's like for me anyway i feel i feel quite strongly about like us being a family but we're being really we're different in the family like even your own normal family you have that one uncle that is just like out there really weird but you absolutely mm-hmm. love it and then you have that one auntie that nobody really talks to because nobody's sure why nobody talks to her because she's just weird but like at Christmas, you all get together and you're all a family, regardless of your differences and your dress senses and your weird sense of humour. Yep. But you're all one family. And I think that's what we're called to be. You know, when we come to the foot of the cross, we're all one family. And so we should look for ways to include people. And that's a legacy that maybe we should all try to, to mm. leave. We should all try to be people that strive for unity and inclusivity within our different church families that form the body of Christ. Okay. Um, go on, G. No, I was going to say, at the very start, one of the ladies in the group, the lovely Jane, mm. when we're oh, talking yeah. about, I have heard it said of you, she mm. said, interesting fact, that is exactly how I met my husband. He's a manager mm. at McDonald's where I also work. And the first message he sent me was that he had seen how much joy I had even in the hard times at work oh. and wanted to know about my faith. Now, Ooh, isn't that a wonderful witness? What about that? Just, he's got what about, 
that of it, and that's him more than said, you know, I've seen you do it. Not I've heard of you, mm. but I've seen you do seen. it. That mm. is wow. powerful. That's so that cool. really is, isn't it? You're our very own real life mm. Ruth there, Jane. Yes, yeah, she <laughs> really oh is. My goodness. Uh-huh. Seen on the job, Jane. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. You have to be working there. Yeah, I um I I I think that's powerful. That that really is. And how many of us can mm. actually really say that true, that that's how we met our spouse? Or that's how we met a friend or whatever. Yeah. Mm. I do I do know another couple. And uh turns out both were uh she was a widow, he was a widower. He was mm. sitting in a cafe having a coffee, and he spied her help a partially sighted person cross the road. Mm. And he said, I'm gonna marry what woman that's the type of woman I want to marry. The one. And he goes out and makes himself known to her. And several wow. months later, they got married. So they did. So you say, you just don't know who's watching and who's seeing us mm-hmm. do something, do you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And this, this should, that's also a big deterrent from gossiping. Because you just yes. never know who's listening. And so, mm-hmm. you know, I know sometimes we think it's just a bit of a chat. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it's just, just be aware that yeah you know that's true when you're doing that and and i think you know and there's this there's a fine line between having the conversation and it turning to gossip very exactly. quickly like what are you <laughs> what i usually do there is if someone comes to me and says hey giselle did you hear about sedona my start what and they'll start talking i said no hold on a minute when we have this conversation can i go to sedona and say that mm-hmm. We were talking about it and how concerned you were. And if mm. the person says no, I say then no, it's not talk, it's gossip. Mm. I'm away. Yes. But mm, if they really say, oh good. yeah. Yeah, oh yeah. That let's let's go and let her know then you know it's concern and you carry mm. on with the conversation. So that's how to, to differentiate. Differentiate. Because that's exactly what I was gonna ask you, G. I was gonna oh, say, Oh sorry, oh right, people. I jumped in there. Sorry. No, but, no, but yeah. you absolutely, you know, birds of a flag that we we great minds think alike <laughs> and all that. But clearly yeah. that's what I was gonna say, because sometimes, especially as women, because we're such emotive, um mm-hmm. verbally expressive features yeah. for the most part, not all women. Uh, but most of us are verbally expressive, emotive, and so our, our hearts and our mouths can run away with us because it's sometimes quicker than oh, our brain big engages. Time. Big time. Um, but I, I think, like, you know, I like I just... let's be honest, it's good to have a good old gossip, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> with a cup of tea and a digestive. <laughs> oh my goodness. I, I thought it was bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> or is it bur- um... what, bourbon? Why don't you call the biscuits? I can't remember. Um, oh yeah, a, bo- a bourbon whiskey, yeah, bur- or custard bur- cream. <laughs> you thought I meant bourbon whiskey, did you know bourbon? Biscuit. Oh, that would that would go yeah. down a treat yeah. as well. <laughs> a can of bourbon biscuit, yes, or hobnob, hobnob. Oh, mm. oh yeah, oh, my no, that's a really good. Those one. are very that's... British biscuits, guys. Oh, oh yeah, I know. but the non British you're, you're, you're going to think I'm such a granny, a rich tea biscuit. Love oh, what about biscuit. a rich tea sandwich? Actually, that's the best of all of them. Oh, rich tea. oh how do you make on. a rich tea sandwich? Get two rich teas, butter right. each one, okay, and put right. jam on the and put the top of one another. Oh, and especially strawberry jam. You bite into it, and the strawberry jam comes up through the holes in the rich tea biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> one of the ladies is going, going nice. to <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'm Guys, trying that this as a is weekend. why Britain is never winning any food competition anytime yeah. soon. <laughs> or what about a s'more? Yes, I but like s'mores. S'mores are gorgeous, aren't they? I like yes. s'mores, yes. Yes, I like s'mores. Not I to say we gossip anything. over s'mores. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, no. You can gossip over that. biscuit yes. brands, yes. that's all yes. right. Yes, yes. Yes. yes, I was talking about having a right old gossip over a cup of tea and a, and a yes. biscuit. No, yes. we're... There, there is concern, and there's times that we do sisterly and brotherly concern, mm-hmm. um, and we are to be concerned about our family in Christ. We really are, mm. and there are times that we do need to get somebody else's advice on a situation or something like that. But mm-hmm. that's how I would treat it: is that can I go and speak to them afterwards to let them know? Mm. And if they say yes, then carry on. If they say no, mm. it's gossip. Mm. Bye bye. Yeah, I think you can also know based on what the person is saying, right? Because if you're coming to somebody for concern, you're seeking advice. Mm-hmm. You want mm-hmm. something to happen. 
Yes. But if you're just coming to talk about somebody and then it's like, oh, wow, it becomes this topic of entertainment. Yeah, yeah that's straight up gossip. Yes. And also exactly. as well, this is like a really good thing because it, it's a legacy thing. So once people know, like people know, like at work, people know I don't entertain gossiping. So they never, they, can't, they never come to me. Like before they yeah. used to, but then they quickly learn that I won't join in. I don't find it funny. Like, you yeah. know, when they, they do a joke and then I'm just sit there going, miss the punchline. Um, so over time, I just, I'm the last one to hear anything because they're just like, oh, well, we, we thought you that you wouldn't want to know anyway. And so yeah. like, I think even within your circle of friends, you can very, very quickly set mm-hmm. yourself apart yes. as being the one who will not entertain nonsense. And so they will very mm. quickly know that if we are, you know, if we want to gossip, so-and-so is not the person to go to. If you want to mm-hmm. go out for a night on the piss, so-and-so is certainly not the first person you should call. If you want to go out and do nonsense, this is not the first person you should call. This should but be the last person. But if you need good advice need, about a situation, you need good, yes. so-and-so is the person yes. to go to. Yes. Yes. What, what a legacy. Yes. Big that time. is a legacy. That, 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 and sometimes that to, takes time. Yeah, I think sometimes you have to. It's also how you present yourself because sometimes people can misrepresent themselves. Oh, yeah. Mm. So, for example, you may not be... Say there are many people who do things just to fit in, right? Yep. You may not really be into going out and getting drunk or whatever, but you pretend that, oh, you don't oppose when people propose things to you and you just go mm. along with it. So people think you're fine with it, but deep down you are not. So mm. I think sometimes it's good to have the courage to say, you know, something is not really me. Okay. And mm. it, it can be a bit uncomfortable if you're different, right? Among so many people. But I think it's really important to, to try. It doesn't mean that you have to perform. Because sometimes you are just who you are and people will misread you full stop. But I think it's it's good to be where possible, as mm-hmm. clear as possible about who you are and what you stand for. Exactly. Mm. Oh, Lady, wow, ladies. Do you Look know it's 20 time. past nine? I know. We've yes, had such a wonderful you know conversation. What has time gone? Yes. It does fly past. Thank Thanks you, back ladies. into your rich tea biscuits. And <laughs> I oh, I will. Yes. Don't you worry. <laughs> the, rich, the, rich, the rich tea sandwiches. Digestive yes. biscuits should be banned, especially the chocolate. Oh my oh, lord! No, they good. shouldn't be. Oh, oh that's digestive and chocolate together. Why? Ooh, get Why? that woman out of this group. Come on, come on, get her out of that. Yes, I think that's our cue to just yeah. say oh. a prayer now from Gum So. Yes. Oh, let, let's Father God, it. no. The prayer request is, Lord, can chocolate biscuits be banned? Digestives in particular. <laughs> Oh, Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for um, sisterhood and laughter and conversations. We're grateful for um, our very tastes in chocolate biscuits <laughs> and um, rich tea sandwiches and um, those amongst us that just prefer it plain and salty. <laughs> we thank you, Heavenly Father, because you have made us all wonderfully in your image. And so everything about us is beautiful and blessed by you. Lord, we ask that you would be with us, Lord. Help us to live intentionally for you. Help us to point people to you. Um, Help our lives to be a legacy, Lord, that people look at and wonder where our hope comes from, where our joy comes from, where our peace comes from. Lord, and that when they inquire, we should point them always to you, Lord, and for your glory, Heavenly Father. Lord, as we think about um, leaving a legacy, Lord, it's very close to thinking about our own mortality Mm. and perhaps the mortality of of our loved ones, perhaps those that are um, a lot older than us and parents and grandparents um, or even siblings and, and, and also maybe those that are poorly but are younger. Lord, we ask that. Um, as we contemplate mortality and legacy and and what this means for us as human beings, knowing that our lives here on earth are finite, we ask that you would help us to live for you. Help us to live each day, Lord, for you, knowing that you, Lord, give us the breath of life. You, Lord, allow us to see each day. Mm. And so, Lord, as we go forward in each day, help us, Lord, to live each day to a way that brings glory to you. Heavenly Father, help us, Lord, to be those that are quick to forgive, slow to anger, but quick to compassion. Help us to be quick to forgive people. Help us to um, be the ones that are peacemakers. You said, blessed are those that are peacemakers. 
They shall inherit the kingdom of God. Help us to be those blessed peacemakers, Lord, um, but also be able to set healthy boundaries, Lord, um, and at all times, Lord, um, looking to create healthy relationships that are good for us and for our children and for those around us. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would help us to be those that champion inclusivity within our different church families. Help us, Lord, um, to be able to be the ones that want to draw people in to the family. Um, Jesus, when he was on earth, he walked with the lame, the blind, the outcast, the tax collectors. He is a real champion, Lord, of the outsiders. And so, Lord, help us to be those that want to live a legacy, to be known as those that are also friends to the outsiders and the disabled, um, those that shunned by the community, um, you know, the, the neurodiverse. There's so many groups of outsiders these days that sometimes just are in the church, but they feel like they're just slightly on the outside looking in. Help us to be the ones that go alongside them every week or as often as we can and try to include them in the family. Lord, we ask that you would help us, Lord, um, because all these things we know are really for our own good, Lord, but all for your glory. Lord, we ask that you would keep us safe and bless each and every one of us over the next seven days. Until next Thursday, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 That was beautiful, sort of. You say the most mm. powerful, beautiful prayers. You really do. So. Holy Spirit does it because we go from talking about jam. There you go. Yeah, that's jam true. biscuits. Yeah, jam, so, rich tea, butter and jam, especially yes. strawberry yes. jam, and but a big you, a, and a great big cup of tea. There you go. Send me oh, the picture. Send, send me the picture if you're having a jam or a, a rich tea sandwich. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. Good, good night, night. ladies. Thank, Thank you, you for, for coming, in. everyone. And it's really good to be back with you all. It really, it really is. Yes, mm. I, I have, I good have to missed have you. you. Back, oh, thank you. I have missed you all. So this, yeah. this, this is my little piece, piece of sanity. So it is on a Thursday night. <laughs> the we love around. you. We'll see you all next week. Okay. Good night.